Welcome back, friends. I know I've been gone for a while, so first I want to thank you for your patience. A lot has happened in that time, both good and bad, but things are on the upswing. Um, I don't want to talk for too long here, but I do plan to put out a video next week letting you guys know what's been going on in my life. Um, as you can hear, I'm congested, so I'm sorry if that bothers you, but I've waited over a week to stop being congested and I just won't. I had the flu all last week, so that was fun, um, but still congested. So we're gonna continue on and march forward. So, um, but I would like to share with you next week some of the lessons I've learned while I've been away. Um, I am incredibly happy to be back though. It feels good to sit in front of the camera again and to be making videos again. So stay tuned for updates next week, but for now, let's talk about what really matters. At the cusp of adulthood, the only constant in life is change, and not all change feels positive. 19-year-old Logan Schindelman left college after one year, struggling with his newfound adulthood when he suddenly vanished. Today on Dark Matters, the disappearance of Logan Schindelman. The number 29 was well known to the students at Tumwater High School in Washington State. It was the number of a talented defensive back for the school's football team, Logan Schindelman. But Logan wasn't just a number. Friends knew him by his room-brightening smile and by his magnetic personality, which drew people of every kind into his circle. Athletic, easygoing, and happy, Logan was a warm and welcomed face in Tumwater's hallways. Though he was popular and well-liked, he had a quiet and sensitive side at home where he lived with his grandmother, Jenny Jibo. Logan's mother lived in nearby Olympia, Washington, and was still a frequent and supportive part of his life. Logan graduated from high school in 2014 and was accepted to Washington State University over 300 miles away from his hometown of Tumwater. Unfortunately, his first year at college didn't leave him with a sense of purpose or direction. His great uncle, Mike Ware, spoke with Crime Watch Daily and said Logan's first year was, quote, unpleasant, and he hadn't made many new friends there. His grandmother also told Crime Watch Daily that Logan cut ties with his high school friends after several incidents right out of high school, quote, made him really aware of racism he hadn't really thought about as much. Stuck without a sense of direction after his first year at Washington State, Logan returned home to Tumwater, but things had changed. In addition to his grandmother and half-sister, he was now living with his half-sister's boyfriend, whom she'd moved in while Logan was away. But Logan had changed too, and family noticed right away that he'd become more withdrawn. He spent the next year performing odd jobs in town and helping his aunt and uncle Mary and Mike Ware on their five-acre farm. But according to Mike, home life was tense for Logan, and he, quote, didn't want to be there. But it seems Logan's family had only a glimpse of Logan's inner turmoil. Thursday, May 19th, 2016. While getting ready for work, Jenny Jibo receives a call from her grandson. Sounding nervous, he tells her he's had an epiphany about himself he needs to work through on his own, that he is out driving around. When Jenny asks him to elaborate, he says it's hard to explain. Jenny says they can talk more later when she returns home from work. She later regretted not asking him to talk right away as he never came home. Friday, May 20th, 2016. Logan still hasn't returned home and Jenny hasn't heard from him either. At 11 a.m., she pings his phone and is relieved to see it's in Olympia, Washington, within eight blocks of Logan's mother's home. Assuming he went to see his mother, she continues on with her day. Approximately three hours later, 911 dispatchers receive multiple calls about a southbound car on I-5 near mile marker 92 between Maytown and Tumwater. 
The car is dangerously drifting across lanes, and witnesses see a white male, approximately six feet tall, close the driver's side door of the moving car, move to the passenger side, and exit the car, running into the woods. The car is a black 1996 Chrysler Sebring convertible, but no one can describe the driver because no one else is inside the car. After crossing three lanes, the empty vehicle hits the median and stops. The car is impounded. Sunday, May 22, 2016. After not hearing from Logan all weekend, Ginny's worry grows. Family phones Logan's mother, but receives chilling news. She hasn't seen him in a week. Ginny drives both to the Thurston County Sheriff's Office in Olympia and the patrol offices at Tumwater Airport to report her grandson missing, but neither facility is open and no one has any idea where Logan is. Monday, May 23rd, 2016. Ginny reports Logan missing and police get a match on his car's plates. Logan's black 1996 Chrysler Sebring convertible was the car drifting across I-5 the previous Friday. Since no one has seen or heard from Logan for five days, Thurston County assigns Detective Frank Frawley to Logan's case. Inside the car, authorities find Logan's car keys, his wallet with his debit card and ID in the glove box, and his cell phone in the passenger seat, something he was rarely without. On top of the middle console was a grocery bag filled with snacks and $25 in cash. Officers take evidence photos of the car and fingerprint the inside. Family and friends launched their own search while detectives continued their investigation. Thurston County sanctions a two-mile radius land and air search of the woods near where Logan's car was abandoned. Despite the dense foliage, they bring in canine units but find nothing. Meanwhile, Ginny gives police permission to go through Logan's room, computer, and his phone, which only lends more questions to the mystery. After the phone pinged near Steel Street in Olympia on Friday, where Logan's mother lived, police tracked the phone's path, starting just outside of Portland, Oregon. It remained there for around 44 minutes before erratically trekking back and forth on I-5, north, then south, then north again, and south again, stopping where Logan's car hit the median. It is unknown if Logan was in possession of his phone during its journey. Even more strange, detectives revealed that there was a Facebook check-in from Logan's account at the Olympia Regional Airport. At this point, Detective Frawley has no evidence pointing to foul play, but no indication that he is alive and well either. Authorities then learn of a secret meeting that might have had a large impact on Logan's life not long before his epiphany. Being a mixed-race child raised by only one side of his family, Logan recently sought out the black side of his family. According to his great-aunt Tina Crary, the meeting was an emotional one. She told Crime Watch Daily that after being shown a photo of his grandfather, Logan said, quote, It feels good to see someone that looks like me. Tina sensed both Logan's desire to learn more about this side of his family and his apprehension at his grandmother, Ginny, who raised him, finding out about it. According to Tina, Logan said, If she finds out that I came here, she's going to be really mad. Some family members thought she purposefully kept him away from this side of his family. Crime Watch Daily questioned her about this accusation, and she responded. We were told that you were trying to keep Logan away from the black side of his family. Well, I don't think that's true either. They made no effort to get a hold and see him. And I had pretty much not talked to his father, his grandfather in years and years and years, so there was just no connection. I wasn't actively trying to keep him away. We may never know the exact dynamic of Logan's family, but we do know that waiting for answers has been agonizing. Regardless of whatever crossroad Logan found himself at, his family continued to search for answers, as did the community of Tumwater. Total community fundraising efforts raised $10,000 in reward money for information in Logan's disappearance. 
A sign featuring Logan's case was put up along Interstate 5, close to where his car was abandoned. Family and friends held vigils to publicize the case, but the lack of leads have been frustrating, to say the least. There has been no activity on Logan's bank account since the day he disappeared, and a year later, law enforcement is stumped. Family and friends spent June 27, 2017, Logan's 20th birthday, reigniting the search for their missing loved one, putting up flyers all over the county, following leads, and sharing posts on social media, pleading for information. Then, just three days later, authorities released a possible development a sketch of this man. Thurston County Sheriff's Office believes he may have information on Logan's whereabouts. The sketch comes from a witness who saw Logan sometime between his call to his grandmother and his car crashing into the median. On the way to work, she saw Logan's car on the right shoulder of the southbound lanes on I-5. Later, on her way home, she saw his vehicle again, but this time, Logan was there. The hood of the car was open, and a black male, believed to be Logan, stood at the trunk of the car with two white males. The first was the man in this sketch. He was a white male standing approximately six feet tall, with a thin build and straight blonde hair. He wore high-water jeans and a tank top that was too small. She only caught a side glimpse of the second man, also a white male with blonde hair but shoulder length. He wore a flannel shirt and jeans, and so far, no one has come forward with information on the two men's identities, but whether they are involved or not in his disappearance is left to speculation. According to Detective Frawley, the family is split on what they believe happened to Logan. His great-uncle Mike Ware believes the tension in the home came to a boiling point. Theory number one. Half-sister's boyfriend. Mike Ware, also a former law enforcement officer for Thurston County Sheriff's Office, believes the tension was caused by Logan's half-sister's boyfriend, whom she moved into the home while Logan was off at college. According to Mike, the two didn't get along to the point of physical fights, something Jenny Jibo denies. She agrees that they didn't get along, but says they avoided one another when living under her roof. The boyfriend agreed to a polygraph and passed, but Mike Ware, who is fully aware of the inaccuracies and controversies surrounding the polygraph, knows he could have falsely passed. However, it seems authorities don't consider him a suspect, despite Mike's theory. Theory number two, drug involvement. Detective Frawley can't eliminate the possibility that Logan's disappearance was drug-related. The only publicly known connection between Logan and drugs is that he began smoking marijuana while at college. However, there's been no evidence or mention of him doing dangerous drugs or any indication that he was around any dangerous crowds, so it's a possibility that lacks any evidence as of now. Theory number three, identity crisis. Logan's final call to his grandmother concerned an epiphany he said he needed to sort out. Since Ginny Jibo never got the chance to sit down with her grandson for further details, the revelation that Logan spoke of remains a mystery. That hasn't stopped people from speculating about it, though. Some theorize that the family dynamic and dysfunction drove him to leave it all behind and start over somewhere new. We do know he met with the black side of his family, whom he hadn't had much contact with, and he may have been at war with himself about his identity as a biracial man, wanting to know more about the side he never knew and feeling guilty to the side of the family that raised him for even having that desire. Maybe there was no family conflict, but an internal battle that drove him to get away and find himself anyways. Others think he might have been on the verge of or struggling with a mental illness. The Thurston County Sheriff's Office has said that there was some sign of a quote, burgeoning mental health issue. It's possible he left of his own volition for a number of different reasons, but for him, maybe it felt like he didn't have a choice. There are those who believe Logan may have taken his own life to escape these struggles, and others who think he is alive and well. Theory number four, foul play. Logan met with some sort of foul play. Authorities speculate the two men seen with Logan near his car before he vanished could, at the very least, know something and, at worst, have been involved in his disappearance. 
the man who abandoned Logan's car on I-5 and one of the men seen with Logan by his car had similar descriptions, but it can't be conclusively stated they were the same man. Online sleuthers have suggested everything from a drug deal or robbery gone wrong to an accident, maybe related to Logan's severe peanut allergy or a cover-up. But as for now, there is no evidence of foul play and we can only hope Logan is alive and well and will return to his family who is waiting with open arms. Strangers touched by the case have gone to great lengths to aid the family's efforts to find Logan. In Olympia, strangers organized a yard sale and donated all the proceeds to reward money for information on his case. For authorities, Thurston County Sheriff's Office has no reason to believe a crime has taken place and his case is still open. For Logan's family, the pain of not knowing hasn't dampened their love or their search for their missing loved one. The Facebook group Logan Schindelman is Missing, run by Logan's great aunt Mary Ware, has nearly 10,000 members, strangers, friends, and family who hope one day to have answers. And his family may have disagreements, but they are all clear about one thing. If Logan decided to leave on his own, they want him to know he's loved and always welcome back if that's what he wants. They just want to know he's alright if he is out there somewhere. Logan Schindelman has a severe peanut allergy. He did not have his EpiPen at the time of his disappearance. When he went missing, he was 19 years old, 150 pounds, almost 6 feet tall, had black hair, brown eyes, and a small scar on his left forearm, just beneath the elbow. He was last seen wearing a black windbreaker, jeans, and a white shirt. He was possibly sporting Nike shoes. If you have any information on Logan's whereabouts or the circumstances of his disappearance, please contact the Thurston County Sheriff's Office at 360-704-2740. Special thanks to the Patreon family. The names you see on screen are just some of the people who financially contribute to this channel. Whether they are passionate about cases like Logan's or the other dark content on this channel, their support cannot be overstated. If you are interested in supporting the channel, information is in the description, but even if you only continue to support by watching, thank you. Thank you for giving Logan's case a moment of your time, and my heart goes out to his family and friends. They've gone too long without answers, and we all hope for those answers so that closure can begin. The family does have a You Caring funding campaign set up to establish more funds for reward info leading to Logan's whereabouts. It is linked in the description if you want to contribute. And no matter what you choose to believe or what you speculate, I ask you only for respect in the comments below. This family is suffering immensely, and I ask that you respect them as well. And remember, though these may be dark matters, the darkness always matters. Thank you for watching the video. Exposure to cases such as Logan's is highly important. And thank you all for your continued support and for always receiving these cases openly and respectfully. Stay safe, friends, and have a good night.